Welcome, everybody. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we are meeting today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, after lectures of immune cell signaling and neglected viral infections, we come back today to one of the cornerstones of we are infectious disease research, which is malaria. And um, undoubtedly, one of the outstanding leaders of WEHA's world, of WEHA's world class malaria research is associated Professor Wai Hong Tan. Um, she studied molecular biology of the University of California in Berkeley and received her PhD from Princeton University. She is currently lab head and joint division head of our infectious disease and immune defense division. And we'll talk today about how structural biology, immune epidemiology, and molecular parasitology helps us to better understand malaria parasite invasion. Thank you very much, Wei Hong. Um, yeah, so thank you, um, Greg, for that um, um, intro. And yeah, it's a real pleasure today to talk to you about uh, malaria parasite invasion, and in particular, um, also to welcome the Inspire students who I understand got your schedule changed and you're actually sitting here um, to attend this lecture. And yeah, we look forward to working with you, Jun, um, for the next um, nine weeks. So um, feel free, it's a pretty sort of relaxed talk. It will probably f um, feature quite a bit more structural biology, um, but um, you are welcome to just sort of put your hand up if you do want to ask a question in the middle of the seminar and we can definitely go through um, things or if you prefer to leave it till the end of the seminar, that's fine as well, but I'm pretty easy about that. So today, um, uh, I'm, I am going to focus on malaria. I'm going to give you... Um, sort of a feeling on the different structures um, that proteins use to get into red blood cells. So if you're not familiar with malaria, in 2016, uh, while we have had experienced quite a lot of decline in mal malaria deaths, in 2016, malaria cases rose for the first time in a decade. And this is due to a whole bunch of compounding factors, drug resistance occurring and also elimination agendas not being um, completed in some of these um, countries. But one of the stats, you can get lots of stats in malaria, but one of the stats that I sort of still remember is that um, every two minutes, a child um, basically still dies of malaria. And these are really children who are under the um, age of five. And so, in general, there's still around 200 million malaria cases a year, uh, resulting in just um, under 400,000 deaths um, worldwide. So, in terms of malaria, there's, they, they're caused by um, the species Plasmodium, and Plasmodium actually has 200 species. Um, but what's very interesting is that out of the 200, only six actually infect humans. And they're listed here, falciparum and vivax, which I'll actually focus on today. But you also have ovales and the malaria and pinosia. And pinosia is actually a zoonotic malaria. Um, inherently, this question, there's a very fundamental biological question here is that out of the 200 Plasmodium species, only six are actually able to infect humans. So the biological question here is, what makes the six of these human malaria species special, and how do they only recognize human cells? And that's the one fundamental question that we're interested in. This would be a standard malaria life cycle um, image. And so you have basically um, two hosts. You have the mosquito and then you also have the human, okay? So the life cycle starts with the mosquito biting the human, and it would then inject an invasive a form of the malaria parasite, which looks somewhat worm-like over here, called the sporozoi. So the sporozoi will go into your bloodstream, and the first site of infection is actually your liver. And in your liver, it will grow from one sporozoi to tens and thousands of new parasites. And so this is basically the liver stage infection over here. 
After the liver, after it's infected the liver and there's tens of thousands of new parasites, what those parasites do is come out of the liver cells and then start to invade the red blood cell. And this is the red blood cell cycle, which is kind of um, with the box here, is the cycle that we're very interested in um, at WeHi. We do, Justin Body's lab does work on the liver stage cycle, but our lab um, works on the blood stage cycle. And the reason why we work on a blood stage cycle is that one malaria parasite can invade a healthy red cell, or grow into a trophozoite and then a schizot, and these just keep maturing. But one parasite can make about 16 to 32 new, new malaria parasites within 48 hours within your blood. After 48 hours, the reason why it's in your blood is that it actually is eating up your hemoglobin as a food source. And once it's actually digested all of the hemoglobin, it's going to rupture out and find a new red cell. And it is this infection and this rupture that causes all the clinical symptoms of a malaria infection, such as fever and chills. So why, the reason why we work on this stage is that if you can stop the infection and you can stop the malaria parasite from getting into blood, then you can actually alleviate a lot of the clinical symptoms of of um, malaria. And there is another cycle here, which is the sexual cycle, and that will go through the mosquito and then, then um, through development through mosquito, then reestablishing that life cycle from mosquito to human host. So a lot of you would have seen this as a classic image from the National Geographic. And what it has here is that all of these things here are healthy red cells. But in here, you actually see infected red blood cells. And inside this infected red blood cell, this little round oval thing here is actually a malaria parasite. And so you can see that in this case, the red cell has ruptured, but in this case, this is still infected with some of these round blobs here, and those are actually malaria parasites existing uh, within your blood. And so we can look at the malaria parasite multiple ways. Um, the one that I showed you before was by EM. We can also look at it by a standard light microscopy. And this is actually how people would actually diagnose malaria anyway in the field sites. Um, this slide is a little bit different. This is not what you would see in terms of the field because what we've done is actually enrich for some of the late stages of the malaria parasites. The reason why we know it's a late stage is because every purple dot that you see here is actually a single malaria parasite, okay? So one, one of these red cells would have been invaded by one parasite and it's grown 16 to 32 new parasites. What you see in terms of this um, den dense dark spot here is actually not a parasite, but it's where the digest, uh, digested hemoglobin has gone into. And through the digestion process, hemoglobin is actually digested into toxic product. And what the malaria parasite does is to crystallize that product and keep it into the digestive vacuum. And this is what you see in terms of this very dense spot here. But all the things that are purple is stained by Gimza, and each single dot would be a malaria parasite. When it's done, you can see then the parasite tries to get out, and then what you have is all of these individual purple, red, uh, purple dots can invade a new healthy red cell, okay? So this would be sort of a still picture of individual, what we'll, call, we'll talk about, called merozoites, and that's the invasive form of the malaria parasite. This is a merozoite. The yellow thing is a malaria parasite. It will turn itself around and then penetrate into the red cell. And you can see all the yellow things that are coming off is actually the surface coat of the malaria parasite. Parasite actively propels in, and then you start the growth stage cycle for 48 hours. And this ruffling that you see in the red cell is what the malaria parasite does during the process of invasion. It changes salt concentrations within the red cell, and the red cell undergoes this thing called echinocytosis. So it would be a hallmark of successful invasion. Echinocytosis, or the ruffling of the red cell, will resolve within 10 minutes, and then the parasite will grow, grow in there for about 48 hours, remodel, and also eat enough um, food that will make about 16 to 32 new copies. And this is an um, animation done by Drew Berry, who's an artist in residence at Weehai. Here's live imaging, okay? And so here you see the blue is the malaria parasite, 
it contacts the red cell, and the green that you're seeing is actually calcium signaling, okay? So there's very, very active processes that are occurring when the parasite actually contacts the red cell, it will start a whole series of molecular events that then allow the parasite to propel its way um, into um, the red cell. The next movie that I'm going to show you was actually taken by the Center of Dynamic Imaging. It's unpublished data, but I think remains one of the nicest uh, movies that you can see in terms of parasite invasion. It's quite a fast movie, so I'll, before I start it, I'll talk you through it. What you see here basically is side view of the red cell. And what you see landing on the red cell are these green dots, and the green dots will be the malaria parasite. And what I want you to notice is that when the malaria parasite lands on the red cell, it actually changes, the red cell actually cushions the malaria parasite, and then you will see invasion. But it's a very quick process. So just so keep your eyes um, peeled. Uh, here, okay. Oops, sorry, it's a bit green but you see they've gone in. Yeah, and this is, we do see this where we do actually see sometimes, normally only one malaria parasite would invade one red cell, but sometimes depending on the dilution of the red cell, you can get multiple invasions in there. But they land and it's a very active process and then um, they actually go in. And so throughout the years, we have very many different views of the parasite um, invasion. And this is really invasion purely into red cells that I'm going to talk to you about. So what you can see here is the cartoon version on top. And then here is by basically DIC. And this little dot here that you see is the malaria parasite. And it's going through different phases of invasion across um, um, the red cell. And you can also obviously uh, follow that through IFA. You can see that initial contact point here with the malaria parasite, and then blue normally stains DARPI. Red cells don't have the nucleus anymore, so DARPI is the only thing that would stain the malaria parasite. And so you can see it contacts here at the apical tip, and then it gets propelled into the red cell, and then after that, the red cell surface, which is stained in red, um, will also seal, um, and then the malaria parasite will grow in there. Another image by Drew Berry, um, and this really is one of the nicest illustrations of what this invasive form looks like. So the invasive form of the malaria parasite that invades red cells is called the merozoite. Okay, so all that yellow um, surface coat that you see is actually now shown here in gray in these um, in this kind of carpet. Okay, and what we've done is take a slice through the malaria parasite to kind of show you what actually exists inside that malaria parasite. It's got a nucleus, but also has these really specialized organelles at what we call the apical tip. So it's not completely round, the malaria parasite. It has basically an oval and this thing called an apical tip that's a little bit pointier than the rest of the parasite. And at the apical tip, there are these organelles called rock trees, which are these pear-shaped organelles here. And then these other organelles in dark purple are called um, uh, micronemes. And what they, do, what they do is they, in the micronemes and the rock trees, Right? Their whole purpose is to establish invasion and proper entry into red cells. And they will carry proteins and they will carry lipids that will help with the invasion process, but also to set up the new home. So then if you look here, this is basically the red cell and then the malaria parasite contacts the red cell and actually actively injects things into the red cell as it undergoes invasion. Here is basically an EM where you have the malaria parasite and then here is the surface of the red cell. And what you see here is injecting of lipids. And the lipids can kind of help set up another membrane um, that the parasite will live in. So through many decades, you know, the first, in 1970s, the first, the ability to culture malaria parasites um, um, was established. Um, and since then, this is how we've actually been able to understand all the process in invasion because the establishment of that in vitro culture allowed us to do genetic knockout, allows to grow parasites in bulk scale and do all the standard molecular techniques that you would be familiar with. 
But so if you would take out a general review in terms of parasite invasion, you start to see large schematics like this. But really, the only thing I want you to remember is that parasite invasion is a multi-step process. You have a, a merozoite attachment, and then you get the merozoite reorientating, so the, so the pointy end actually contacts um, the red cell. When it does that, then there's a lot of protein-protein interactions that occur here that then form what we call a tight junction that then propels the parasite into the blood, and then you get a resealing. That's this part of merozoite, uh, Parasite invasion is what I'm interested in because this part, after the parasite is reorientated, at the apical tip, there's lots of parasite proteins that interact with human proteins and commits the parasite to invasion. And so we're very interested in understanding what those protein-protein interactions are. And as parasite invasion is taken apart, you can see that more and more people are identifying what's present on the parasite binding to red cell receptors and also different complexes that function in terms of moving the parasite into the red cell. Okay, so what we're interested in really is just trying to understand how does the merozoite form this very intimate connection with red cell surface. So here's the apical tip again, and we're just interested in what are parasite proteins that actually recognize human red blood cell proteins. Because if we can understand that interaction, we can find ways that will actually block um, that invasion. And I showed you, you know, a whole bunch of com uh, schematics where you, know, you can have parasite proteins, which are up here, binding to some red blood cell receptors here. So for falciparum, the red blood cell receptors would be basically glycophorins, complement receptor 1, and basogen. And we'll come back to this interaction a little bit later um, between RH5 and basogen. Our lab has focused not just on falciparum, but we've also focused on plasmodium vivax, which, are shown, which is kind of shown here. Um, on this diagram. And the reason why we focused on it was that there were all these question marks underneath here, where you knew what the parasite ligands are, you knew what the parasite was using, but we, there was a real gap in the field in trying to understand what are the human red blood cell proteins that would let Vivex um, enter into the red cell. And Vivex is also very different from falciparum in the sense that Vivex has a very unique ability to only enter the youngest of your red cells, which are these cells called reticulocytes. And what we're interested in was to actually understand what is on the surface of these really young cells called reticulocytes that would let Vivex um, go into red cells. And we published this work and we identified a new invasion pathway and basically the, vi the, the red blood cell receptor on reticulocytes is called transferrin receptor 1, which I'll tell you about. And it binds a parasite ligand called RBP2B. I'll just refer that to RBP2B. And this drives a new way that Vivex can actually enter into um, red cells. And what is transferrin receptor 1? Transferrin receptor is actually an essential protein on your red blood cell surface and also on a whole bunch of other cells. But it actually is involved in mobilizing iron into your cells. It's one of the major pathways for getting iron into cells. So transferrin receptor, which is here in the Y, will sit on the membrane. It binds transferrin, and transferrin actually carries the iron. And through a process of endocytosis, and then a fusion with the early endosome and a pH change, then the iron then gets released into the early endosome. And then you get this recycling of the transferrin receptor complex, um, a transferrin receptor up here. It's definitely crucial for iron delivery. But from an infectious point of view, what's really interesting is that transferrin receptor is used as an entry receptor for Vivex, but also for a virus called neural hemorrhagic arena viruses. So somehow pathogens and also hepatitis C. So somehow pathogens are actually co-opting this really essential protein to actually enter into the cells that they want to live in. And to actually look at that, we're going to move down to a resolution um, where we can actually start to look at how parasite proteins and how human receptors actually um, interact so that we can then dis um, understand really these protein-protein interactions. And so that for that, we, we um, used a new structural techniques called cryon electron microscopy, which was awarded the Nobel Prize a couple years ago, purely for advances that would take 
uh, protein um, images from this resolution to the resolution at this present time. And this was really advances in sample preparation, in data analysis, and also um, basically ability to freeze um, proteins um, in a way that you could then image them and the use of electron microscopy. We call this the invasion complex, the Vivex invasion complex, and these are basically kind of images, 2D class images of the invasion complex. I'll go through that, but there's three proteins in here. There's the parasite protein, and then there's two other human proteins that the parasite protein binds to. And what you can see here, and so what you can see is that in green is human transferrin receptor, and it actually forms a dimer, so there's two molecules of transferrin receptor, and it's um, forming a butterfly structure here in green. There's also a human ligand called transferrin, and that carries the iron, and so transferrin binds to transferrin receptor, okay? So the thing that's in green and in blue are human proteins. All right. What we then have in purple is the parasite protein. And this is how the parasite protein actually has bound to the human receptor. It sort of wraps itself at the edge of the human receptor, both at transferrin receptor and transferrin. And what this tells us is really the point of contact that we have between parasite ligand and human receptors. This is the movie showing the same thing. What we want to understand from the structural biology is where are the, the, the big contact points that you can see here. So we see a really extensive contact point with transferrin here. And then there's also a smaller contact point here with transferrin. All right, so because this is where the pro, uh, parasite proteins are binding, so what you can do is you can take it apart like a Lego piece. So this is the purple here. And what I've done here is just to take the purple part, bit off. And I've colored the point of contact that the, the, the parasite ligand has with the human receptor, transferrin receptor. And then in light blue here is what it has a contact point in terms of transferrin. Okay? So now you can start to see these are the surfaces that the parasite ligand is contacting with the human receptor. And so these become the surfaces that we can then target with either antibodies or drugs to stop um, this, um, um, to stop this interaction. But in terms of malaria, malaria parasites as well, you know, they have coexisted with us um, for a very long time. And what our lab is really interested in is what we call the arms race, or basically the tug of war between infection and human evolution and also parasite existence. And so these, what you see here are basically sequences from about 200 parasite isolates that have come from Asia or Asia Pacific. And when we look at the, those sequences and we look specifically at RBP2B, which is the protein, the parasite protein that we've been talking about, you can see that there is a signature here, two peaks at both nucleotide diversity, but also an area of the protein that's under natural selection in parasite populations. So this is an area of the protein that is constantly undergoing some um, evolution. And as you would have it, this area here is the area that actually interacts with the human receptor. So what you can do with structural biology is you can then map those sequences onto your structure to understand how they can affect that interaction. And so what we've done here, I've shown you what we have in green is the interaction with transferrin receptor, and then blue is with transferrin. And these pink things are residues that are under selection in, in parasite populations. And so you can see that while some of them don't, don't map anywhere close to the interaction sites, we do have some field polymorphisms here that do actually map very close to the interaction site. So it'd be important to understand how those changes in the parasite actually affect um, um, protein interactions. We can map another series of um, residues, where, which have done a lot of mutagenesis, and the, in yellow are basically residues that are critical for um, the parasite to interact with the human receptor. And you can see here in this case, you see the interaction site is here, and of course, there's a cluster of polymorphic residues, but also critical residues that will govern that invasion. So this part of the protein will be really interesting to look at um, in terms of the modulation of that interaction. 
Structural biology can also show you how human ligands interact. You know, we obviously don't forget that transferrin receptor is not really co-opted by pathogens, but really it's a very important human protein for transporting iron. And this is, for me, I find this really interesting because this, this is where human proteins bind. And so this was a cryo-M image showing, as I've shown you before, transferrin receptor binding to transferrin. Transferrin receptor also binds to a protein called hemochromatosis factor. So if you have a mutation in this, you tend to have an iron overload um, disease. And also recently this year, um, earlier this year, they showed that transferrin receptor also binds to ferritin. And these are different proteins that can bring in iron. So this is what transferrin receptor does to bind human proteins. And also then now we have structures for how they bind um, infectious agents. So I show you the cryo-EM that we have between Vivex protein binding transferrin receptor and transferrin. But also there's an X-ray cryptography image of how Machupo GP1, so Machupo virus is a newer hemorrhagic arena virus found in South, um, South America. And Machupo GP1 is the entry glycoprotein that the virus uses to enter cells. And you can see that as with the Vivex ligand, Machupo GP1 has also used the apical domain of transferrin receptor to enter cells. So somehow this apical domain with human ferritin binds is somehow a privileged site for pathogens to enter. And there's a lot of biology that we can understand here in terms of what governs that entry um, into red cells. Of course, with high-resolution um, images, you can then look exactly at this interface. And I'm not going to go through all of this, but really we can map you know, where human protein binds, this is in green, interacting with parasite protein in blue. And you can actually see all of these protein-protein interactions. And this becomes a way that we can start to then design um, inhibitors or antibodies that can block this interaction. And you can obviously, with um, structural methods and uh, functional um, functional mutagenesis, you can interrogate whether or not each of these protein interactions are really important um, for that interaction. We use another technique, uh, which is X-ray clusterography, which most of you will be um, familiar with, uh, as an ability to map where inhibitory antibody binds. And so I won't go through a lot of our antibody work, but we've made a lot of antibodies against the parasite ligand to try to block invasion. And so what you see here is that complex of um, transferrin receptor bounded parasite ligand and these blob colors in red and in yellow and blue are basically small antibody fragments that block parasite invasion and block complex formation. And you can then start to understand actually how they work. So we've got a parasite, uh, we've got an antibody here that would block the interaction between the parasite ligand and transferrin. But really you can start to see that a different way of working is actually when this antibody binds here, the protein can't actually access the membrane. So it's actually causing inhibition by blocking access to the reticulocyte membrane. And so what I want to then switch um, uh, gears here is I've talked to you a lot about Vivex. I hope to convince you that we, we identified a new um, invasion pathway, but really to just show you the new structures that came out of that work. But I'm going to move to falciparum because um, the Vivex protein families has a homologue in falciparum. So falciparum is the most lethal of the human paras malaria parasites. Vivex um, can kill people, but less. But it's also the most widespread, and, and it also causes relapses because it has a hidden form in the liver. And these uh, is what falciparum in, in, um, uh, clinical incidents looks like across a world map. And you can see some of the heaviest burden in terms of falciparum incidents is actually um, in Africa. Whereas the Vivex map looks like this, where we have a lot of infection in um, South America and also in Asia, but we have almost a complete absence of Vivex infection in Africa. And this, this is because this comes back against with the evolution between human and malaria parasites, is that in Africa, most African individuals have a polymorphism in this receptor called Duffy. 
at the upstream region that doesn't express Duffy antigen on red cells. And Duffy antigen is another one of these essential receptors for Vivex invasion. And so really in, in Africa, you don't see any Vivex invasion but you actually see a lot of falciparum invasion. But this also implies potentially that the burden of Vivex um, in Africa was um, quite strong, resulting in essentially um, selection of a polymorphism that prevents Vivex from invading cells. All right, so we go back to this thing. I talked to you about, I talked to you about RBP2B binding transferrin receptor. So we have this family of proteins called RBPs. But in falciparum, the homologous family is called RHs, okay? And RHs, there's a lot been studied in terms of RH, but we're only going to focus on this protein here called RH5, which binds to its receptor called basogen. If you look at um, RH5 in terms of the protein, it's the smallest protein in this family, but it's a really important protein in terms of invasion. It remains to be um, the leading vaccine candidate now under development for falciparum blood stage infection. And the reason why is that you can't knock out RH5 from any of the plasmodium species. It's absolutely essential. It's also, in a very strange way, non-polymorphic, highly conserved across multiple clinical isolates as they've mapped. So this makes it a really good target in terms of vaccine design where you don't have to deal with the challenges of the parasite mutating all the time. And also critical across all falciparum strains currently tested. So really a parasite ligand that can is used in invasion across Indonesia, Africa, um, Papua New Guinea, Thailand, so forth. So we've taken out um, isolates from across the board. And what we do is that while they don't have, this is the cryo-EM image of 2B, we're going to focus on this small portion here of um, the structure because I will show you in the next few slides how much RH5 actually looks like this structure while maintaining an ability to actually recognize very different proteins. Okay, so to do that, we also had to crystallize um, the Vivex counterpart, which is 2B, uh, which we then diffracted at the Australian synchrotron. Here are basically um, three crystal structures, all right? So I've talked to you in, in uh, pink, I've talked to you a lot about RBP2B. That's the one that I showed you, but this is the very small domain at the bottom of um, the cryo-EM. All right, I'm going to show you basically the RH5 structure, which is in blue, and then also we have another crystal structure that we determined called RBP2B, which is a Vivex protein. And I hope you can see that actually just visualizing it like that, they're very similar. I'm going to start the movie so you can look at the overlap of the structures, but just be aware that um, there's two things here, a disulfide bond up here at the tip of the molecule and then also another disulfide bond here and you can see how conserved these structures are. So you can see that where um, the disulfide bonds there are quite important for protein folding and also um, the loop, and I'll tell you later, is actually really important for um, host trophism, okay? So as you can see, all three of these structures actually overlay each other extremely well. There's some flexibility at the top um, of the structures here, but really this is, if you talk about parasite adhesins and you talk about what that structure looks like in terms of the RBP family or the RH family to get into red cells, this would basically be the structural scaffold that we're talking about in terms of malaria parasites for this family of proteins. If you just then look at, surf, if you look at um, surface charge, negative charge, positive charge, then you start to look that see that these structural scaffolds show very different charges um, across um, the three different structures. For RBP2B, RBP2B, we talked a lot about, it binds transferrin receptor, and this part of the protein actually binds transferrin, very positively charged. RH5, which I'll go through a little bit later, binds this other receptor called basogen, and I'll show you that structure, and it looks totally different from transferrin receptor. 
RBP2A has a negative charge patch here. We don't know what the receptor is, but we do know that if we actually mutate um, this negative charge here, we totally lose red blood cell binding, which suggests that that patch is actually governing receptor recognition. This is the RH5 structure. So I've shown you in, in what I showed you before is in gold, okay, where we showed the movie where all those three crystal structures were overlapping. And what you see here in blue is actually its human receptor called bacigen. Okay, so as you can see, it's totally different from transferrin receptor. And what, what Bacigen does is to actually bind the tip of RH5. And so I apologize, I'm showing you all these structures upside down, but Bacigen here would be basically on the red blood cell surface, okay? And so then this would be kind of the tip of um, the RH5 interacting with the red cell. All right, and it seems to interact kind of at this ape, at this top of the um, RH5 um, protein. And then if we overlay, basically, this is the RH5 basogen binding site, which we can show here in kind of this teal color. And then if we overlay the RBP2A negative charge, it actually overlays really well with that interaction site. So somehow the scaffold, that protein, at least for these two proteins, that's actually where the receptor will bind. And there's a really interesting disulfide bond here that actually forms a loop that is then um, um, uh, exposed um, to engage um, with receptor. And the way that they found RH5 and the way they implicated RH5 to be critical in terms of invasion wasn't from the initial knockout studies, but was really looking at malaria parasites, falciparum parasites. When you take falciparum parasites, there were some falciparum species that could invade into monkeys and some that couldn't. And so using a genetic cross, basically what they showed is that there is a mutation at the tip um, of that disulfide loop that actually governs what we call host trophism, okay? So here you have basically this disulfide um, bond and there's a loop here, um, uh, depending on Vivex or falciparum proteins, five to three amino acids. And in, false, in, in um, RH5, a residue 347, depending on whether you have this residue, you can actually go into monkey cells, okay? And so this then implicated, and, and this was done as a genome-wide sequencing study, and it was the only mutation that would govern the entry of falciparum PHRH5 into monkey cells. So basically implicating this polymorphism to be important for host trophism. And now um, also um, from Alan Kalman's group and Wilson Wong um, earlier this year, they also then pulled out the cryo-EM um, of what the cryo-EM image looks like in terms of RH5 and the complexes, um, the, the parasite proteins that it interacts with. So here you can see um, this is RH5 here, all right? And the basogen binding site actually exists, um, is over here. RH5 binds two other proteins called Cipra, and then it also binds Ripa as well. And these proteins, which I haven't shown you, are going to insert into the membrane because they know from uh, molecular parasitology that this, um, the complex, when it binds and forms, actually creates a pore into the red cell. So while they have the cryem for this um, ternary complex, what we need to see now is how it actually inserts into the membrane. But what the, structural, what the structural biology allows you to do is then to understand points that you can target. Because if you can block now, apart from developing antibodies that can block bacigen, which is this surface over here, you should be able to also develop antibodies to RH5 and to Cipra that can block this interaction, which is key for invasion. And of course, the cryoEM then opens up another interface, which is this interface here between RIPA and CIPRA. All right, and this is what the structural uh, methods um, let us do. Because this is only a small part of RIPA, there's actually a much larger part of RIPA that we can't see structurally. But really, the, I, the visualization of this complex basically tells us all the different points of contact that we can develop drugs or antibodies that will actually block um, that. Um, formation. 
The other interesting thing is that if you then start to collect all some, you know, there's actually more structures here which I haven't put on coming from human antibodies, but these are actually mouse antibodies. So here are, here's basically RBP2B in purple, and then at the bottom in gold is RH5. And you can see these are where inhibitory antibodies actually bind. And if you look then, there's a subset of, of antibodies that actually seem to target the tip of the parasite ligand, right? And this is this tip that I talked to you about that had that polymorphism for host trophism. So, you know, you can start to, dis you know, when you start to get these high resolution images, you know, you can then start to think, are there commonalities that you can find between Vivex proteins and falciparum proteins? And can you actually rationally design something that will recognize both the Vivex protein and the falciparum protein? to actually disallow that protein from contacting the membrane and then developing actually an antibody that would be cross-specific for both of these um, um, uh, parasite, malaria parasite. And this just highlights the point that you do have protein, you do have antibodies that block protein-protein interaction, but one of the really standard modes for um, antibodies to stop parasite invasion is to actually create steric hindrance with the membrane. All right, And so here again, you can probably swap this area out for RH5. And RH5, if you've got an antibody that binds here, it can't then actually interact with the red blood cell membrane. And so then this provides a way that we can actually start to actually look at all, all of the structures that we have and actually design something that would be inhibitory across the board. And so I hope to have I hope to have given you a flavor of actually there's lots of structures that we have in terms of parasite invasion, but what I've focused on is actually on a family of proteins um, called the RHS and the RBP family, and to give you a flavor of what the structures look like in terms of this family. You know, really structure is function. The reason why we do this work is to really take apart all of the interfaces that we have between the host and the pathogen to understand how those interactions actually occur so that you can actually block that process of invasion. I hope to have also shown you that actually single residues on these structures can govern whether or not the parasite can go in humans or whether it also has an ability to go into um, uh, monkey cells as well. And this is really important because you, you, we need to understand what actually causes also a parasite reservoir in monkeys where you can potentially get um, zoonotic infection. And also to give you a flavor of what we call this evolutionary arms race, you know, this tug of war that you have between human populations and pathogens and how they're trying to coexist together, but yet, yet there's obviously a huge amount of selection both on the host receptor and on the parasite protein and how then can you actually use that information to develop basically an intervention that would be um, effective across um, multiple populations. And of course then to use these structures for rational design. And um, with that, uh, thank you and I'm really happy to take your questions. Thanks a lot, Wai Hong, for this beautiful journey through the structural um, evidence how important this kind of field is for um, vaccine development. Um, we have plenty of time for questions, and um, I would also like to uh, invite our uh, Inspire students and guests to ask plenty of questions. Ah. Um, really nice talk, Wai Hong. Um, I was just wondering, so uh, you picked one interaction in Vivax and um, falciparum. Um, I was wondering, since that junction between the parasite and the red blood cell involves so many different protein interactions, do you think blocking just one of these might be able to stop the invasion? Or do you think the other interactions might compensate for loss of this one interaction that you may have blocked with an antibody? Yeah, and so what we're doing, what we're doing in falciparum, um, there's many different protein complexes um, sort of assigned to distinct steps in invasion. So tight junction formation might be governed by one complex and initial attachment by another complex and so forth. And the reason for doing that is exactly to combine uh, multiple interventions um, across the board. 
especially for falciparum, which I didn't go into, falciparum uses a lot of redundant um, receptors to get in, even in that initial stage, which is why they were which has always been the biggest hindrance in terms of developing a vaccine for falciparum, except that RH5, if you do target that, it's probably a really critical one. In terms of IVAX, that's exactly what we're doing. You know, we, we really think that understanding all those question marks that we see underneath um, will then put different complexes across different stages of invasion. And so you can imagine that, you know, a really effective thing would be to target the initial recognition of reticulocytes followed by another antibody that blocks tight junction formation. That's it. So that's why we want to uncover all the structural biology across all the different complexes and then combine antibodies together. Yes. We have conditions where RBP2B, great question. We have conditions where RBP2B binds transferrin receptor by itself. But anything that we require a stable complex like ultracentrifugation, cryo-EM, or size exclusion chromatography, we always see uh, only the presence of the ternary complex. So we do think that while it can bind transferrin cell for itself, the binding to transferrin <coughs> as well just stabilizes the whole complex. So I think probably what we're seeing in the parasite is actually they would bind both transferrin receptor and transferrin as a complex. Do you ever see patients that have naturally produced antibodies against, say, RH5? Yeah, so, so definitely that's exactly where we're going. So we're pulling out human antibodies from human populations. So with RH5, it's a little bit... With RH5, they've done that work as well. They've done that through uh, either vaccination studies or from human populations. RH5 is a very peculiar one because if you look at all the serological data, there's not a lot of antibodies that are being produced to RH5, but people are definitely baiting them. And you see some of them mapping to some of the mouse monoclonal antibody work. For RBP2B, it's starting to be a really interesting story. So if we go in and look at human populations, young children, adult populations, high transmission setting, low transmission setting. I think now we've looked in Papua New Guinea, Thailand, Brazil, and then also in Mali. RBP2B always um, has a very strong immune response in natural populations, and also the presence of those antibodies are correlated with clinical protection. So it's, it's super fascinating. So what we've done is gone into Cambodian individuals and pull out these human um, monoclonal antibodies, and and then we're mapping them all. But so interestingly, they don't they compete with the mouse antibodies, but they are not exactly the same epitope. But the mechanisms of inhibition is very similar. Yeah, Matt. In endemic regions, you never achieve sterile immunity. So how does that? How do you equate that to targeting invasion? Because invasion can still occur. So is it ever possible to stop invasion if you can't get sterile protection? Yeah, I think two very different separate issues, um, right? And so we do know that like when uh, malaria parasites infect humans, they actually also modulate the immune system. So there's a lot of um, uh, things that influence B cell a germinal center formation and really an effective um, kind of immune response you know, affinity maturation, so forth, right? And so uh, the, the big question in the field has always been, can you actually target invasion because invasion occurs so quickly, all right? Sterile immunity, I think, is a very different thing because if you talk about vaccination, then the, re the way you get around is to boost the levels of antibodies that you would have in individuals, and that amount of antibodies could then provide an effective way of um, hitting invasion. But the big question around invasion has always been around the speed of invasion, which actually occurs within two minutes of it contacting the red cell. Um, and it seems like with invasion ligands, the challenges are to make the antibody titers high enough and to have antibodies fast contacting antibodies. That seem to be two themes that are coming out in the invasion space. And then I think last week, an uh, uh, um, article was published in Cell, where one of the RH5 antibodies 
very interesting antibody was that it had always a synergistic <coughs> inhibitory effect with other antibodies across all those different stages of invasion that we talked about. And the way that that was doing it was that that ARH5 antibody was slowing down the invasion process through a mechanism that no one understands how, but they filmed it and it would actually slow down the invasion process, allowing other inhibitory antibodies to contact. So those are the kind of things that I think are the bigger challenges in terms of invasion. Oh, there's got to be more. There's got to be more. Ah, you're an inspired student. Yes. What's your name? Uh, okay, who are you working with? Oh, lung cancer group. Okay, you should come work in invasion. Yeah. <laughs> but great, I'd love to take your question. So uh, I'm curious about how prevalent the Yeah, so that's um, that's great because that's a key that's a key thing as well. So in falciparum, they have other um, vaccines that would target that as well. But I'll come back in terms of Vivax because Vivax is a really key challenge for us. Um, and so RH5 and RBP2B definitely is expressed in almost all the clinical isolates that people see. There are some parasite antigens where you don't see you know, in some clinical isolates. But for those, they're definitely expressed. I think to target them would be quite useful. For RH5, probably a bit easier because it's not changing. RBP2B, a little bit trickier because it is changing um, across the clinical isolates. But the liver stage in particular for Vivax is extremely important, okay? Because that liver stage infection, falciparum doesn't do this, so falciparum doesn't relapse. Once it comes out the liver, it will invade red cells. So if you target falciparum in red cell and you get rid of red cell infection, then you are clear of the parasite, okay? Vivax, you can clear the red cell infection, but you don't know when the liver form will come out again or what we call reactivate. Reactivation can be one week. Reactivation can be two years, nine months totally depends on the Vivex um, isolate. And right now, there's only one drug that targets that form in the liver. And it's hard to use because if you've got a G6PD deficiency, you will, hemol you know, you will undergo hemolysis. So definitely in the Vivex world, you know, what, what they think of, and 80% and of relapses occur coming from the liver. And they know that from studies that they've done in both Papua New Guinea and also in Indonesia. So you do need to target that form. So definitely in Vivax, you have to target that form in the liver, and you also have to clear the blood stage infection. That's not a compromise for Vivax. Falciparum, you could probably, you know, depending on who you talk to, <laughs> target only the blood. If it relapses, then you combine it with a drug. So you combine the vaccine with the drug and stuff. And then so you really, you have to, once people are infected, you just hit them with the primaquine or tefenaquine, get rid of the, the liver stage, and then put the vaccine in. You know, vaccine is not, um, the longevity of the vaccine, I don't remember actually for RTSS, but it's not, not necessarily more than a year. So that's a real issue as well. Yeah, and it's, and it's something that they, they, they sometimes don't see when they're testing the vaccine, but then they start to see a lack of efficacy when they're using it in malaria endemic regions. So it's tricky. Yeah. Any other questions? How long to win the evolutionary monster? Oh, forever. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, as you see here, like it's not doom and gloom, but as you see here, there are definitely parts of the protein that are conserved and parts of the protein that are not changing, that contact receptor. So there's ways that you can actually 
um, you know, develop an intervention that would hit multiple, um, multiple strains. Oh, here we go. This might be a silly question, but um, why don't we vaccinate the mosquitoes seeing if their life cycle is on? Yeah, yeah, and so I think there's this heaps, which I didn't talk about, but obviously there's, um, you know, there's ways to clear the infection from humans. So then, you know, but we, you have to, as you mentioned, there's two hosts. One's the mosquito and one's the human host. And so what I've talked about is clearing it from um, the human host. But definitely in the mosquitoes, there's a lot of effort um, uh, um, in, uh, in uh, killing uh, the mosquitoes. And obviously all the insecticide treated bed nets target um, the mosquito. I think like maybe a month ago in Science, they published a paper where they were targeting the parasites inside the mosquito with human anti-malarias. And so that's something that they are going to look into a bit more, a little bit scarier because of parasite resistance. If you drive parasite resistance in that population, how that then affects parasite resistance in human populations. But that's something that they um, have been talking about. And also then uh, together with dengue um, and malaria, they're looking at um, Wolbachia, which is actually infecting um, the mosquito with a bacteria that reduces the uh, malaria, the, the mosquito fitness so that it doesn't, it can't um, transmit the parasite. So there's a lot of effort in the mosquito side, um, but yeah, very important as well. Yeah. Any more? Oh, welcome to our lab. <laughs> um, I, I wonder um, what kind of method that we use right now to, what, what kind of model of uh, Yeah, and so we use human blood um, to study falciparum invasion because it, and it's blood that we get as a discard product from the Australian Red Cross. We have everything. So like there will be uh, mouse studies, um, there's also uh, monkey studies as well, um, depending on the parasite that you use. But because um, in falciparum you can grow it in the lab, they mostly do like in the petri dish and check all the antibodies in the petri dish. When they actually move into real clinical trials, they might try it first in a humanized mouse system and then they might move into Iotis monkeys and then now we actually have what we call a human <coughs> challenge model where you're actually vaccinating um, naive individuals and then checking to see whether or not the vaccine or the antibodies work there. There are differences in terms of, the biggest differences are never really whether or not they block. Um, so the difference would be the level of blocking. So they do block. Uh, when you get to human challenge, always it seems like the level of blocking that you had predicted from previous models always seem less. Um, they, they can't, um, the, the longevity of the antibody response is also um, really, really different. And it always seems that in human challenge trials, the level of antibodies that you need to have protective inhibition is much higher than predicted from other models. Yeah. Okay. Oh, last oh, one. last one. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if I contribute a lot to the innovation. <laughs> Oh, it's very interesting. Uh, I don't know so much the comparison between falciparum and um, Vivex. So people study falciparum invasion in old cells, but if you give them reticulocytes, they prefer reticulocytes because they're younger, metabolic, more active. You know, they've got this iron transport thing as well. So iron definitely is a, has a complex relationship in malaria. So people who have malaria tend to be anemic. And if you give them iron, you know, to try to alleviate the anemia, some of the early iron supplementation trials had to get stopped because people were getting hyperparasitemia uh, because actually, you know, parasites are using that added iron. So now they're um, in Santa's group, they're sort of looking at iron supplementation trials in the presence of malaria control and to try to see can you give iron um, safely to a population that's anemic but not cause 
you know, an increased infection with malaria parasites. Thanks. Thank you for your questions.